Hi, Kazavin. Welcome to this podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Greg, before we start and talk about leadership in video games and in the game industry, I would like to congratulate you and your team once again for the fantastic game, Hades. Fantastic success. You guys, I'm sure, are a huge inspiration for a lot of studios all over the world, including us at Deadmage. So thank you. Th thank you so much. It's been... Um... Yeah, it's it's been well beyond uh, what we could have expected. That's that's for sure. Um, we're really really grateful that the game has found this kind of audience and and brought brought some joy uh, seemingly into a lot of people's lives. That's kind of what we what we hoped it could it could achieve. Just to give people a a positive and lasting impression and create this kind of setting where players could spend more time in it kind of with their with their friends these these characters that they'd meet along the way um and and so yeah we've been we've just been amazed um at, at the kind of outpouring of support that it's received mm -hmm. okay greg uh let's start with your story into leadership what was your first leadership role when was it can you tell the story yeah my um my leadership responsibilities uh, started at in a previous line of work. Um, prior to getting into game development, I worked uh, in the gaming press. Um, so I was a game critic and uh, spent most of my career uh, at the website GameSpot, um, where I joined uh, as an intern in 1996. I was kind of fresh out of high school um, and um, had done a, a, like a little bit of game writing, a little bit of um, a website building on my own. Um, and it was enough to get me an internship there. And GameSpot was was special um, at the time. You know, these kind of gaming websites were just starting to bubble up, but GameSpot was like one that was established as, as kind of a, um, it had a big team from the start. It was like a real, you know, serious operation as opposed to like a kind of a hobbyist thing like like what I was doing just before. Um, so that was really exciting for me. And I was, you know, it, it became my job to to write about video games. It's kind of like as someone out of high school, it's it, it was very, very exciting because I've been playing games, uh, you know, all my life and loved writing about them, loved kind of dissecting them. Um, um, and I I stayed at GameSpot in the end for more than 10 years, which starting off as an intern, I couldn't have expected, but I, I kind of like rose through the ranks over there, becoming an associate editor um, after college. I started working there full time. Um, and uh, by the end, I, I was editor in chief and running the editorial department. Um, and also as, as part of my responsibilities running the editorial department, I, I was I was collaborating with all the other departments at what was then, you know, pretty big organization. So, you know, similar to at, at like a larger game studio or something, we have a art department, we have like a uh, like a um, an engineering department, we have a marketing department. So I was interfacing with with all those groups and uh, basically had to learn a lot of that. Uh, as I went, um, I was I was fortunate to get some formal um, management training, like leadership training along that path. And, and, I, um, uh, and I studied to get an, uh, a master's in business administration kind of on the side through, through online classes. So it's not the fanciest version of an MBA, but it's an MBA nonetheless, uh, in addition to my English degree from, from college. So, um, so that combination of experience is, is what gave me whatever background I have in leadership. But like many people in the game industry, you know, I didn't I didn't enter this line of work to like to lead people, right? Um, it's it's something that came up along the way. Um, but as soon as I was respond as soon as people were like reporting to me or I was, you know, at near the top of a department, the 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 responsibility of that uh, weighed uh, quite heavily on me. So I wanted to um 
try and improve at it and learn it formally uh, as much as possible, even, even though I think it's easy to kind of turn your nose at stuff. Like, oh, you know, management training, you know, it's easy to kind of wave it off. But but I always, you know, it, it just felt important um, because, like I said, you know, there's a whole there's other people um, whose whose careers and livelihoods are, are on the line now, not just my own. So mm -hmm. sure, sure. That's right. Do you remember what your biggest challenge was the first time you had leadership responsibilities? Let's see. I think um, I think it is that I think it is that sense of um, you know what I, I would say it was inheriting a team. I didn't form the team. I'd been working with the team. Yeah, so it was it was quite complicated at the time, actually, with um, in the GameSpot days. So a lot of things happened. Um, GameSpot got acquired by um, a company called CNET Networks, um, which is which is you know, later became part of CBS and so on. This is in 1999, um, and we we like merged, they had their own competing gaming website. So one of the first challenges was that we like started working together directly with a competitor. So that was, as you can imagine, um, had, had some awkwardness to it. Um, I was still, I was still not, um, like, I was still more, I guess on the, on the periphery of it's a long time ago. So I'm pausing to remember. Um, but, um, not too long after we we kind of merged together and some people were laid off and that was difficult and then it was um a couple of years later in 2002 when when another thing happened which was gamespot also used to have two separate websites this is a very much a relic of the past <laughs> where uh, computer games and like video games slash console games were like two totally separate entities and it was two separate websites, one covering computer games, one covering uh, video games. And in 2002, we merged. We're like, it's one game spot. We're going to cover all platforms now. And that was the time when when I became in charge of the editorial department and, and this whole team that used to cover video games kind of under their own organizational structure now reported to me. They were my colleagues. I, I worked with, you know, along with many of them uh, for many years, but they didn't you know, it's on a peer relationship. So it's that situation where all of a sudden your peer is promoted above you um, and and someone who might have been, you know, your buddy or something like that. Now you're reporting to that person. So that was um, that was definitely my first big and sorry. And on top of that, um, it wasn't long after that, that there were that there or at the same time, actually, there there were layoffs and we lost like in the consolidation, we lost some members of our team. So it was a it was a tough situation because I'm like, I, I likened it to uh, in the movie Empire Strikes Back. There's this almost like a running gag of Darth Vader like like choking you know one leader <laughs> after another on on his on his uh, star destroyer. Um, and so it's like, you know, congratulations, you're now promoted. So it's like that kind of battlefield <laughs> promotion where it's not necessarily under the most pleasant of circumstances. So it mm -hmm. felt uh, to me a bit like a battlefield promotion. Um, and it was a it was a really difficult time uh, for our team. Um, and and I had to, um, you know, I had to sort of earn the, the trust of this team in my new role. Um, and my and and sort of re reestablish the my relationships with everyone. So it required a lot of talking to everyone individually, certainly as a starting point, and then continuing to. Then there was an outward facing challenge as well because there there was this big change in you know we had a big community, so the community is also freaking out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I had to I had to manage. Um, the communication, you know, with a, I, I was on the kind of front lines of talking to the community about what was happening as well as and and talking to members of the team. So yeah, um, you're, you're it takes me back. That's like I said, it's not. Um, this is well before, um, I I 
I became a game developer. Um, I left GameSpot in 2007. Uh, that's when I started my game development journey kind of officially. Um, so this was, yeah, about five years uh, prior to that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So today you are the creative director in Supergiant Games and you must be responsible for a lot of things related to the game and to the people. And you're also, I know that at least you, you, you do a lot of things, but at least I know that you do all the writing on the games. And uh, so you, you have a lot to do both yourself to create a lot of content and um, different things related to the game and also to be in the meeting, see what everyone else is doing, see where the quality of the game is going and the vision. How can you balance these two modes of being? It must be um, tough. Um, the, the balance of these things has always been one of the most difficult things um, for me, I would say. Um, connecting back to my GameSpot days, I always loved being a critic and writing. Uh, I loved writing about games. I loved playing games and and covering them. So I wrote a lot of game reviews. And as my responsibilities at GameSpot increased, there was increasing pressure on me to step away from that type of work because I had, you know, this more important, like frankly, more important work to do to lead the team um, and and kind of interface with other departments and all that sort of stuff. But I I always stuck to it, whether this is the right decision or not, you know, others can decide. Uh, but my reasoning was twofold. One was very simple. I loved the work. And if I gave away this work, then my job would be filled with work. I like, I would be giving up a, a really important part of my work that I, that I enjoyed. And I tried to be conscious about that. Like I, I wasn't, I was working enough to where I was not prepared to make that type of sacrifice of like, now my job will not include a part of it that I actually personally really enjoy. And I further justified it because I felt that my credibility with my team, the editorial team, came from the fact that I was there with them doing the work, the kind of work that many of them were doing. I was there in the trenches with them when there are a lot of games are coming out I'm reviewing those games alongside them. I'm editing their reviews. I'm, t I'm providing them with feedback. I'm taking their feedback on my work, et cetera. So I'm, I'm with them. I'm not just above them doing stuff that's unrelated to what they're doing. And well, I still, example, right? well, I'm, whether it's by example, I, I'm trying to, I guess. Um, and I've always wow. felt that was important. I've always valued the type of leadership that like, in, in my own relationship with people who were my superiors, who are my bosses, I've always valued the relationship where the person, where I don't have to spend too much time explaining what I do and why it's important and so on, as opposed to having the kind of leaders who've like done the kind of work that I've done. So they have, they understand fundamentally what the work is and they often have empathy for the, um, for the challenges of that work. Um, I, I don't want to overgeneralize because I've also had very effective leaders um, who who haven't necessarily done the kind of work that I've done. They they're just you know often very good listeners, very empathetic people, um, very good communicators. They don't have to have the direct experience, um, but it's it's nice when they do. And I think that sort of I, I still feel much the same way here at Supergiant. And, and I think I work with a group of people who are similar. So it's important to understand that we're a pretty small team. Um, we're, we're around 20 people um, that may or may not be small depending on how you look at it, but it's certainly a lot smaller than like a AAA studio or something like that. So there's just not a lot of space for like a pure management type of position. Um, it's, we, we really value that everybody kind of has an aspect of, of craft uh, at our studio. So, so I'm not alone in, in sort of uh, splitting my time between those types of responsibilities. In fact, um, I'm more 
Uh, I don't have uh, folks at Supergiant who report directly to me. Um, so I'm more on the side of being able to be like a, I can focus quite heavily on like my craft, um, which is like the writing and narrative design and other aspects of design. Um, and then I get, uh, I'm involved in plenty of other aspects like uh, marketing our games and all the sort of even uh, community and social media, all sorts of stuff. But um, it, but the, the way to come back to your question, the way to balance it, I think, is to always give priority to the team when, when the need is, is there. It has to take priority. Anytime that like, I, I can unlock someone's ability to keep working well, that is like a drop everything kind of situation. And you do that because uh, the team is more effective than the individual. And so ideally we're in the state where uh, everybody knows what they're doing, has like plenty of interesting work to do. Um, and, and, can, and we have these phases during production where there actually isn't a lot of like meeting and discussion necessarily. Like everyone just has their work cut out for them. And those are really, I think we all really enjoy those times uh, of, of the project. But then, you know, early on, uh, in a project when we're still figuring out what it is, it's it's obviously a lot more discussion, uh, talking to each, uh, not just individuals, but like sometimes, you know, uh, like like kind of departments as it were, our departments are not that big, but, you know, talking to our art team or something like that um, as we're trying to figure out what we're making. And then in those in those types of situations, I, um, I have a, I have what I would describe as like a supporting role because we don't, you know, when you hear a creative director, I think it can mean a lot of different things in a lot of places, but we are not the sort of studio where there's like one person telling everybody it must be done this way. Uh, we, we try to create, we try to choose the kinds of projects that unlock people's individual creativity so they can be kind of very expressive in their own work. So my role does involve trying to identify what type of project that would be, but it's but then it's not like you know, telling telling people what to do. It's more like talking through with them to discover what is exciting to them, uh, in the direction that we're going in, and then and then finding, um, finding the connective tissue between all those ideas. That's like a big part of my role, I think, and and part of the reason why um, I do. The writing and the narrative design is is to like physically sort of tie those things together. Um, that's where I um, and yeah, I love. I got into game development to be like directly involved um, in my first job. Uh, I worked at a bigger team and had a more like supervisory role. But over time, I tried to get closer and closer to the kind of the physical work, the design, the writing, um, and so I'm I'm very at Supergiant. Uh, it's the first time I got to do the type of work that I'd sort of been dreaming about since I was a little kid. And I, I still, you know, now I've been at Supergiant for likewise for more than 10 years. And um, I, I think this is the type of work that I, I can't imagine tiring of it. I just, if anything, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that games take so long to make and I, I want to make way more games than, <laughs> than I will have time for. <laughs> So just try to make each each project count, I guess. Mm -hmm. So so let's say when you are writing and you're focusing on what you're doing, you are going to be receptive to other team members approaching you and saying, Greg, what is this? How can I do this? Or let's, let's have a meeting, right? You're not going to go into your own cave and say, don't talk to me for the next five hours since I'm doing this, right? So it's never finding a balance as you're going, right? Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, I, I guess I shouldn't say never. You know, right now my Slack status is do not disturb <laughs> because I'm speaking to you. So there there are exceptions, but um, the uh, you know we won't be speaking for five hours in this particular case. Um, the um, yeah, for the most part, you know, uh, trying to for sure being available um is an important part of it um and i yeah i've i've always tried to make myself available i would say and just never never be i um i never want to be the reason that things slow down 
um, sometimes maybe to a, to a de back to like the balance or something like that. You know, I, we, we, we imposed a policy some years ago of like, no, no more emailing after 5 PM on Fridays until Monday morning, because we would have these situations where, you know, someone decides to work on a weekend or something like that shoots out an email. And I would see these emails and I would want to respond immediately. Or sometimes I would generate these emails myself. Cause again, I don't want to slow anybody down. We found it had this like, um, yeah, like a pretty negative effect where you felt like you were always kind of on call. My, my mother, um, she's now retired, but she's a physician. So I grew up, she, she would be on call. She had a pager and you know, there's a medical emergency. She has to take the call immediately. So I kind of related to that experience of, you know, always checking my email. If there's anything where I can help move something forward, get on it right away. Uh, but then um, it can be difficult to balance that if it's happening kind of around the clock all the time. So uh, some of these solutions, like kind of calling a moratorium on it over over weekends, I think really helped not just me but many of us to like find some of that balance and at least have um, some some separation um, from 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 the work kind of being being nonstop. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get back to this topic because yeah. I know you guys are popular for this work-life balance that you've managed to have in the studio, and it's a very, very important topic, as you, of course, already know. But, um, Greg, what do you think is the biggest challenge for leaders in the game industry specifically? Any leadership position has various challenges, but do you think there are any unique aspects to those in the game industry, in game development, that might be a little bit different from other industries? You know, it's it, it's hard for it's hard for me to say, uh, having not worked in other industries. Um, I can only I can only speculate, and I'm reluctant to to do so. But you know, I, I think something that is very unique about game development is it's this very like it's very multidisciplinary um and there are other fields that are like that i am i again i i know very little about say like film production or animation production or something like that but um maybe there's some common ground there in some ways where you're you're just working with a lot of different people in different roles um, um, like completely different roles. Um, and the way, even the way to communicate effectively, say like with, with an artist, um, maybe, maybe different than the way to communicate effectively with say an engineer or a designer. So I think like each discipline within game development has, has some of its own kind of subculture language um it's not i don't want to overgeneralize about this because it's not like it's not like this is always true and that's the other part of it which is that um you just again it depends but in in some game studios at least you're you're going to be working with a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life and there's no kind of one size fits all solution in how to effectively uh, interact with them. And yet, uh, through that diversity can come um, really, really remarkable things. Um, so finding ways to like, pull together different points of view into something cohesive into like a, a, a studio culture that works, um, I think is is a, is both a challenge and a really big opportunity. Like it's easy just to to hire as a leader, you can hire people who are a lot like you and are going to agree with you and see things the same way as you. But are you really, are you really doing the right thing there? Or are you just making things more comfortable for yourself? Um, it's, it can be much more valuable to hire people with really different points of view because they can reveal, uh, your, your blind spots, things that you weren't even thinking about that, that may be really important considerations or really big opportunities and so on. So I think, I think like, um, I think that that's 
again, though, I, I don't think that's a challenge necessarily unique uh, to game development. I think I think just about any workplace culture is going to benefit from um, from that kind of mindset. Um, so yeah, I'm not I'm not sure that that there's um, I don't know enough about other industries. Yeah, in conclusion, to be able to say with certainty uh, that that there's something about games that is like unique, uniquely different about them from like a leadership standpoint. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned something very important, and that is knowing how to communicate with different members in your team. Well, they might have different skills, or they might be different types of people. Is is this a skill that you had? since you were a child, or is this something that you were forced to learn as time passed and as you had leadership positions? And in general, this leads to another question, which is an important question, and that is such soft skills, are these um, inborn or can you practice and become better in such things? One example is obviously communication. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I think, um, so I think, I think um, maybe this comes from, you know, playing, playing the old Fallout games or something like that, but they distinguished between being talented and being gifted. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I, I had read other things about this, but I, I like the idea that a talent is something that someone has worked to develop um whereas a gift is something that you're just naturally good at you 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 know from a baby you know you you were an expert martial artist or something like martial arts is an example of something where you can only be talented it's only through um lots and lots of training and discipline that you you can you can be um you can excel in something like that so I think that while people have their natural, they do have their natural strengths and weaknesses. I think through um, through practice and discipline, you can uh, you can certainly overcome many aspects of like innate weaknesses and and rise to become more proficient at something. Whether you'll be as proficient as someone who's like naturally gifted at that thing, I I personally don't really believe so. Like, I don't think I was ever going to be an amazing gymnast, for example. I was not like, you know, I was the type of kid who sat in front of my computer. I was not um, particularly athletic. Um, I was, and rem and continue to be, uh, extraordinarily um, just highly, highly introverted. Like, in a, in a social situation, I, I shut down. I cannot talk to people like i have a great deal of difficulty uh interacting with people i don't know um outside of like kind of a game industry context in a, in a game industry context i feel very comfortable uh, relatively sp uh, relatively speaking but you know if i go to like some random party or something like that with like a friend from high school i you know so so i had to overcome things like that just just talking to people is not easy for someone like me. Um, and that is something where I could, I could feel it. Um, this is again, back to GameSpot. You know, I came in there as a writer, but one day uh, we started making video reviews. We started saying, Hey, let's, let's, we, we actually pioneered the idea of video reviews in the early 2000s. So it's like, Hey, we could, we can make a whole video around this game and we could have the reviewer talk through, you know, it's, the game strengths and weaknesses or whatever else. And I'm like, uh, you know, I'd never done anything in front of a camera like that other than like, a, you know, a high school play one time. So that was something that just over, over many, many video reviews over years, I, I, you know, I became comfortable talking into like a, a black void of a camera like this. Um, and so, so I think, I think for sure, those things, those things can be learned. And I think the, I think someone's like mindset toward it is, is ultimately the most important thing because even people who are like naturally gifted at something they can like, if they don't, if they don't appreciate their gift, 
like I've worked with people who are naturally very charismatic, very, very easy to talk to and so on, but they haven't necessarily, they're not always the best leaders. Um, and in fact, well, the, yeah, the, I, I, I think there's no kind of shortcutting the work personally. You just have to, if you come into a leadership position, you come into a management position, you can, you can focus on improving there, or you can just kind of roll your eyes and say, this isn't what I got into the industry to do or something like that. And just kind of wish you weren't doing it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think I've also seen that like actual management training has made for more effective leaders. They may not grow to become the best leaders in the world, but they certainly got better. So just being focused on improving that kind of mindset, I think puts people in a, in a good position in general, including uh, when they're in a leadership position. Yeah, that was something I wanted to ask you about because in video games, there are a lot of introverts. Yeah. Know, for some reason, I guess video games are very um, interesting for introverts. And these, uh, obviously a lot of them become developers and they become leaders. Are there particular things that you would suggest introverts do in order to become better at people skills? For example, the the course and uh, education that you mentioned, do you think those are the type of things that, that can help or or should they just go and, and do it and learn it the hard way? I, I, um, I think, I think go and do it is that's the response that, that comes to my head. I, I think you have to push past it, um, just more actively. It's like, you feel, you feel that, that anxiety of, or like, to, to, to back up, you know, you're in a work situation and you find yourself at a point where you really should talk to, you know, an engineer or, or the artist or whoever. And you feel that like anxiety of the social awkwardness or whatever. You can even feel it over sending an email. Um, it doesn't even have to be an interpersonal interaction. But I think, I think you know, recognize that feeling um, and, and, and then set it aside and and kind of do do like like recognize the the impulse to procrastinate and wait and wait and wait but just set it aside and and do it as soon as possible um and and i think uh, another really a, a, i think a a valuable skill um that's related to this is knowing when it's better to talk to someone directly as we're doing right now versus sending an email versus sending a Slack message, like uh, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of those forms of communication. Um, it, it seems so obvious to us now at Supergiant, but I think it took us quite a few years to be more discerning about this. But we would we use a tool called Basecamp for our task management. It's a pretty simple like web-based tool. Our, our, our tasks are, um, you know, you just enter a task, assign it to someone, write, write something about what the task is. That's, we, we like to keep it simple that way. But sometimes tasks are unclear, their success conditions are unclear, and we'll start to debate something in the task, right? It's kind of like a message board. We're going back and forth, um, you know, writing long paragraphs, and we've learned to stop that immediately. The moment it's going back and forth, the moment it's becoming like a debate, talk to each other. Drop it right now. Don't talk on Slack. Talk face. You know, set up a meeting. Talk directly, um, and because important aspects of communication, like tone and body language, are are not available in writing. Um, and and even someone like me, where my whole job is writing, or a big part of it, it's very easy to screw up the tone of something that you put in an email or a Slack message, and then if the person you know, gets the wrong impression, then you've totally derailed what you were trying to talk about. And, and the, the fastest way to resolve that in my experience is, is like I said, to talk directly. So that's just one of those things. I think it requires actively thinking about these differences and, and understanding that these are different forms of communication that each have, have their own kind of advantages and, and, and using them uh, accordingly. So, 
you know, I, I think just even maybe in the way I'm talking about it right now, it sounds very, I think to a lot of people, this comes more intuitively. It's just like, what do you, you, you know, you're, you're overthinking this, but I have to, I have to think about it more, more actively that way, because again, left to my own devices, you know, I, I, it's not natural for me to like, uh, you know, Hey, how's it going? How's your weekend? You know, how's that bike ride? Like, I don't, uh, it, it's, it's hard for me to have those kind of conversations. Um, but it, it, but I recognize that they're important. And so you just try to push through it if it's not your natural strength, I think. Okay. Let's, uh, segue into a topic, which is related to what you just mentioned, the, uh, remote working, which almost all studios have been doing for the past yeah. year. Um, what were some of the methods, techniques, or workflows that you guys tried and you were satisfied with regarding being in touch with the team, communication, as you mentioned just now, because when you're remote, it's everything is by default going to be text unless you set up yeah. maybe a video call. Was there anything that um, really worked for you guys? Um, I think, I think like many others, we're still definitely, uh, figuring this out. Um, I would, I would not say that, you know, this is like a solved set of problems. Um, that being said, I think what really helped us is that we were kind of remote working to some extent already before any of this, um, we would, uh, many of us would remote work at least on Fridays. Um, and some of us were remote. Um, altogether. So we had existing experience, just kind of having a combination of um, like face to face, uh, you know, working in the same space and also working with people remotely. So just having had the experience already, I think I think was um, something that helped us immensely uh, to make the transition. Um, other than that, we we did we did try to like create a number of like kind of optional uh like like so uh, essentially social events like a like a like a lunch thing it's like hey there's just a and and this stuff was optional it's basically always optional but you're you're if you want to just have lunch with your colleagues join this call and like chat about stuff so we we tried to emulate some of the um types of social interactions that could happen, not just the work interactions, um, while knowing that it's an imperfect solution, but trying to be careful to not like, like abandon that aspect of the work environment entirely. And then um, we do, we do use uh, Slack um, pretty extensively. Um, but our Slack, we're pretty like, we keep it pretty like work related. We don't kind of over use it, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and everything. Yeah. Um, but we, and, and again, I, I think we just try to have that, that mindset of like when to, when to set up a call, when to talk directly, when to use Slack, um, just to try to stay connected as a team. Um, we try to schedule, um, we don't, have too many uh, meetings, I would say we try to be very careful about that. But we have um, at least one kind of recurring team meeting a week at the start of a week when everybody's there, everybody can talk about what they're working on and so on. So at least you can feel connected to the bigger uh, effort as part of that. Um, and, and see everybody and so forth. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. But yeah, I, I, I think you know, I think the other thing is is just kind of what I was saying before that we try to make sure that uh, everybody has enough like solo work where they don't they're not necessarily reliant on um, having to like um, interact like having that balance between plenty of solo work with with the um, with the more occasional like team interactions so if we if we had to like if we didn't have as much solo work as individuals as we do i think it would be much more difficult for us right now mm -hmm. okay uh let's talk about motivations greg so probably during the past 10 years 
working on various creative projects. There have been many ups and downs. And as a leader, as a creative director, as someone who's holding the vision, most probably everyone in the team is looking up to you and they are expecting you to be always upbeat, holding the flag, pushing everyone forward. How has it been for you? Has there been many days where you have felt you have lost the fire or you are unsure about something? How, how would you keep yourself as the leader motivated? Yeah, I, so I don't, I, I would, I would probably refute the idea that the, that the individuals on the team, like, I'm, I'm not the, the kind of cheerleader necessarily. There, there are, um, I think there are situations though, where maybe, um, maybe that's more true than at other times. Um, it's certainly around our, um, at different phases of the project. But I, like I said, I don't have, um, well, to, to back up to your, to your point, I think, I think the way, I think the way I stay motivated personally is that I'm, I'm very, um, I feel quite driven around the result. I care a lot about the outcome of the thing that we're working on. Um, I love games. I want to work on games that are worthwhile. Um, when times are difficult, and they often are, I'm um, really actively, maybe even desperately sometimes, looking for a, a solution um, to to get us out of whatever rut we might be in, whether it's a if it's a creative rut or something like that. How do we fix this? So we have uh, we often say at Supergiant, and this isn't just me. We 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 feel like we're a problem solving oriented team, and the good news for us is there are always problems to solve uh, in game development. So I haven't. Um, I haven't had situations at Supergiant where I felt like, like, well, it's tough. I, I don't want to, it would be totally dishonest for me to, to say that I, you know, I, I never lose motive. I, 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 I'm easily discouraged. I'm not, um, I have to, that's another thing I have to fight against. Um, I think many writers uh, probably, I, I think it's not uncommon for writers. Like when you're doing creative work, especially in the early stages of it, it's really easy for someone to tear you down because it's, it's not done. It's just this kind of like, I think of like a little fledgling. It's so, it's so vulnerable. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I work with, um, a team that is, that is sort of cognizant of that. And we, we try to, we try to be careful around new ideas and not just sort of run them into the ground right away. Um, but I, I do think I find my, I regain my, I regain my motivation when thinking about the possible outcome and, and knowing that we are able to make these games that uh, can leave a pretty powerful impression uh, on a lot of players and, um, and it's years of our lives. It's like they take a long time to make, and and we um, and then even past that, I think about how they stick with me forever. Like you know, I still think about Bastion all the time. Our first game. It's like so it. I I, I motivate myself by thinking about how uh, I, I think kind of by pressuring myself. <laughs> now that I'm talking <laughs> to you about it, it's like we we have to make this we have to make this count. This matters. Um, it matters to me like it may, you know, again, my mom's a, my mom's a doctor. She's, she's actually helping people. Um, I, I, I have a certain point of view on it. It's like, well, video games, it's not as serious as being a neurologist. However, um, I know video games have been really important to me personally throughout my life. And I, I, I think they matter. I choose to believe that. So, 
Um, they, I think the work we do is important. The relationships we have with each other are important. And when, when push comes to shove, we should just, uh, it's, it's good to focus on those things and focus on, you know, personal well-being as well. Just being very uh, conscious of when, um, you need to take a break from it all and change your scenery and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, motivation is, it, it, it's a, as you can tell for me, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to explain where, where motivation comes from for me. I think mm -hmm. it's just, I'm, I'm glad I don't lose it too often. Yeah. It's just coming from somewhere deep inside related to all the experiences most probably. Okay, uh, Greg, if someone is going to join your team or Supergiant, um, what would you say, what, what kind of trait would be the absolute most important thing that you would expect to see in that individual? It's hard, it's hard to pick, you know, just one thing, but I, if I had to pick one thing for some reason, I would, I would say like a, like a growth oriented mindset. I think the capacity to learn and grow uh, is quite vital in the game industry because it's an industry that is constantly evolving. So even if you achieve mastery in some discipline right now, in another five years, the standards uh, for that discipline may be completely different. So there's a lot of pressure on individual, um, on all of us individually in the game industry to both be kind of the best at what we do and also to know everything. You know, you have to be a specialist and a generalist and, you know, keep up with the changing times all at the same time. It's like, it's it sounds impossible. Uh, but someone who is focused on growing and improving, I, I think is best equipped to um, to keep up with that change over time. And also, uh, I think at every studio, things are done differently. So the, the other thing is like, even if someone is really, really talented, if they come into our studio with just their own, if they're not open to like, they, they they have to be able to um work effectively with with the rest of the team like like the they the the team probably doesn't work the same way as whatever team they came from so they have to be able to integrate into that team and it's not that we have uh i don't think we have like a like we want to bring people on who 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 expand who who change our culture like like it's not sometimes there's discussion around like culture fit. It's like, you want, you don't want people to be like absorbed into your culture and act. It's back to what I was saying. It's not about people should all act the same way. They should, they should grow and expand your culture. Um, but that, that means, uh, you know, interacting effectively with everyone else and learning how things are done. Um, and, and learning their relationships as well. That's one of the things we tell people. It's like many of us who work here, have worked together for years. So pay attention to the relationships, pay attention to how we interact. Um, and that's going to help you be more effective at interacting with everyone else, because it's not like a, it's, it's too small. It's small enough of a team to where, uh, you know, it's just the individuals there. It's like learn and, and communicate how to effectively communicate. There isn't one way. It depends on who you're talking to. So learn the different personalities and figure out the way to, to build, to build trust and interact well and so on. That's just a kind of a natural part of it. Yeah. So I would pick that, but I, I think, I think like, yeah, I mean, someone, someone who's growth oriented also, I think, I think that's a person who values the, the effort involved in, in growing as well. It's like, there's, there's just no shortcutting some of the hard work there in, in improving, I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, you guys have been together for a long time. The core team has is still there. I guess the core team that worked on Bastion is still there, and you have other yeah. people joining the team. There aren't many studios that that have such retentions in them. First of all, two two questions: 
how important do you think this is? And number two, why do you think this happened? What, what was the thing or what has been the thing that caused the, the core team to stay together and deliver great games one after another? Yeah, um, so, you know, in, in our case, um, it's incredibly important. I think it's our lifeblood that we've stuck together like this. Uh, the seven of us um, who worked on Bastion way back when, we're all still there in our respective roles and, um, and our studio has grown. We've brought on a number of extraordinarily talented people without whom uh, Hades, I can't even imagine what it would be without their individual contributions. Um, but the, the games we make are like fundamentally built around uh, the, the individuals that we have. Like we, we try to, uh, back, to, back to my own role, it's like I, I, think, I consciously think about like what type of characters would Jen, our art director, you know, love to create? What type of, what type of setting would would Darren, our our composer and audio director, would he find, you know, really inspiring um, to to create music for? Um, so I think, and and what type of characters would be amazing for Logan Cunningham, uh, who's been the voice actor we've worked with the whole time, would would make it would be really exciting, you know, to hear him bring to life. I I think actively um, about the individuals around me um, and how that can make for a game as opposed to like imagining a, a game and then sort of hiring to to fill the 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 roles necessary to make that game happen so the individuals that we have is basically the uh, the number one strength that we have and also and also the constraint that we have it limits the types of games that we make but um we just try to play to our toward various strengths and i think you know we're, we're all aware that our greatest successes in our uh, careers have been working together. So we found this kind of like, we have this creative chemistry between us it, and it doesn't come from us agreeing on everything. It comes from the opposite. Like we, we have a lot of different opinions. And um, I've said before, like, I don't think we make the games we make. They're not the game that any one of us would choose to make. Uh, they're, they're the synthesis of all of our ideas and they end up being greater than what, what probably any of us uh, could have come up with on our own. Um, how we've done it. Um, I think, I think there's a lot of luck. Um, life takes its turns and we're really fortunate that we've first of all been able to stick together like this. Um, but the other thing is we have tried we, we try our best to make it a sustainable place to work um, as much as we can, though that can be, that can still be, be quite challenging, but it's, it's like, it's just recognizing that um, the work has to fit with, with everyone's lives. Um, and, and so um, be, because it, you know, we, we want to be in it for the long haul. I think another, another reason finally is that it's, it's our, it's an active goal of ours to stick together as a team and keep making games together for as long as we can. Like we actually want that. So I think um, we acknowledge that early on. And so have, have tried to take steps to, to ensure it, I guess. But, but again, that, that doesn't guarantee anything by any means. So when everyone has inputs regarding different aspects of the game, which is which is very beautiful, and obviously you will find features that are probably very interesting because everyone has had an advantage and you're using everyone's advantage. But um, for sure there will be conflicts. Um, how do you resolve conflicts when someone is maybe not necessarily um, agreeing with some something to be added to the game. Yeah, we we talk about it. That's the simple answer. We um, we try to identify when conflict happens um, and and 
and talk until we can reach a resolution um, through like consensus building is really important um, at, at our studio. Um, we try never to just kind of like what when there are sometimes situations when we're like, well, maybe we should vote on this, you know, you know, five people in a room. In the in the rare occasions when we feel like we should vote on something, it always feels like a failure. Like we need to we need to reach consensus and get to a decision that even people who may have been reluctant about it or disagreed with it initially, they're they're like we we find some some common ground to where everyone understands the decision that we're making, why we're making it, and we move forward together. Um, so uh, sometimes, though, you have a meeting and people, you, you know, someone someone may strongly disagree about something. It's not necessarily, I don't think like our, our tempers like flare or anything like that, but sometimes people get more heated. It's like, no, you, you know, this is wrong. We shouldn't, shouldn't do it this way. And, and I think we just try to catch ourselves in those moments. Sometimes it's like you, you reflect on the meeting you just had. It's like, yeah, like that, something felt unresolved. That interaction felt bad. And we, we try to make sure that we immediately sort of follow up on the, after, after you kind of have time to reflect, but soon after that, you know, you talk right away um, to try and move past that instead of like letting any kind of negative feelings fester. Um, some of the worst types of interpersonal situations can happen if, if someone kind of grows to resent somebody else, you know, and, and it's often because they just, there's a failure to communicate there between them and, and they, their values are at odds. Um, and or something like that. And they, you know, one person is just like, Oh, I can't stand this person, but you never, they don't tell that person. They don't, give the person the feedback of like what what is caught what is so frustrating about working with them so we we just try to be more honest with each other about that of like hey i was really frustrated here or like or i got the feeling that you you were really upset during this meeting i just want to talk about it more or something like that so just trying to be open and honest with each other in that way that's hard to do um that's something that is easier for us to do having worked together uh, for a long time, right? We we kind of know each other. We know what our uh, personality quirks are, but we um, but it's also just trying to be very mindful of that as well. And swift uh, conflict resolution is really important. Yeah, on a small team, you don't want people on a big team for that matter, but you don't want people to be like feel super kind of unhappy with the work that they're doing or feel like it we're going in like a a bad direction, making a mistake or something like that. I thought you do the Darth Vader choke when anyone disagrees with you. <laughs> no, that 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 does not. Uh, that was only in <laughs> in my previous workplace. No, no okay. choking, no choking <laughs> necessary. Thankfully. Okay, um, so I have just a few more questions, and then we will wrap this up. Thank you very much. It yeah. it has been a pleasure talking to you and everything, and thank you for sharing all these wisdom and know-how and it's i'm sure it is very valuable for a lot of game devs out there but greg on the topic of decisions and making decisions um in video games specifically the more creative ones indie games mm -hmm. there are a lot of decisions to be made regarding the game and probably mostly during pre-production but then throughout production also yeah throughout for and sure. i guess the better games are made by teams that are able to make these better decisions. Um, for sure, your team has been one that has made a lot of great decisions when it comes to making the, all the games that you have made. What do you think has helped you guys uh, in decision making? Do you think your prior industry experience has had a good effect? Do you think maybe your uh, media experience and being a critic for video games has had a positive effect. What what would you suggest other teams do? Because there are there are a lot of indie teams out there, and many of them start out as indies. They don't have any industry experience or any work experience. Some do. What do you think helps these people in these teams to make better decisions for their yeah. product? Um, I I think. Um... 
I mean, I, I think if we've been able to make good decisions, it's really owed uh, to, to the team and the, some of the dynamics I mentioned before that we, we make decisions together uh, through consensus building and we happen to have uh, seemingly a good mix of different points of view um, because it's not like it, 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 there's always discussion around decisions big and small. Um, um, and then, and then, you know, we get to, we also get to work, uh, on our own, uh, individual craft it, around, around those things. We get to sort of follow our, our individual instincts. We, we make, we make personal decisions around our craft, you know, J Jen as an art, as our art director, or me writing or something like that. I'm making decisions all the time. Right. Um, we, we know when, when a decision is important to discuss or when a decision should be left solely sort of to the, to the expert as the person uh, doing the work um, independently. Um, but I think, I think kind of the true answer is we, we have, um, we have always started small on things. We, we are very like mindful of scope um, and, um, uh, Amir Rao and Gavin Simon, the co-founders of Supergiant, whom I worked with at, at at Electronic Arts, you know, when they moved into a house and started prototyping the game that would become Bastion, there wasn't a big vision for what Bastion would be. They just like did everything one small step at a time, and and anything, any effort that might require you know, weeks and weeks of investment or R and D or something like that. It's not even considered. Let's only work on things that we could do now that we know how to do that. We could start on um, and get cracking and little by little. That's how Bastion came to be uh, the game. It was, and we've, I think we've largely stuck to that ever since that we're, we're very, we just try to make practical decisions that we can, we, we can see how we can do it. Um, um, and it doesn't re require, you know, tons of speculation or tons of unknowns or, or something like that. Um, and, and I think being very grounded that way um, has helped us to, to, to survive, to make like practical uh, decisions that don't sort of get us into tons of trouble when we realize we're in way over our heads or something like that as, as can happen like one of the hardest things i think i think many game developers will concur on this one is it, it, like finishing things is hard um sticking to schedules is hard um and we do owe a lot to our past experience at electronic arts um when it comes to having an, a kind of a built-in production discipline electronic arts at least the team we worked on they shipped games on time and, and those games are very good. We worked on the Command and Conquer team. So they made, you know, Command and Conquer Generals, Battle for Middle Earth 1 and 2, Command and Conquer 3, etc. They were making these games like every year um, and they, they got great reviews. They sold great, all this stuff. So it was a really efficient uh, team. Um, the, the, um, so just knowing how to finish things, um, how to identify when something is like done and you should move on to the next thing. It's really, I think it's really challenging. Um, it requires like good instincts and, and experience um, and a sense of like what what you're even trying to, I, I think like knowing what game you're making, being aware of what the standard is in the genre that you're working in. I think those things are important as well. Um, but yeah, just trying to be practical um, because there's no, there's no magic to this stuff, right? Like having done it, you, it's just, it, it's, it's all just a bunch of work <laughs> that a bunch of people have to do. So deciding um, what to do in what order um, is really, is really tricky, but like focusing on the hardest problem first, uh, solving it in the most practical way um, that, that has helped us to move forward through the years and, and get us out of some of our like creative ruts and stuff like that. You know, we would during pre-production on transistor and stuff like that. We, and on Pyre as well, we spent a lot of time kind of wandering 
um, trying to figure out what we were doing. We have to keep sort of finding practical ways to move forward. Very important point. Controlling the scope, starting with what you can do, and then maybe polishing some aspects that you know how to do, just like what you guys did in Bastion and all the other games. Uh, Greg, you are a writer and you, you've studied English. You have always written. Do you think that writing in general is good for game developers? Because mostly the modern world is kind of, I guess, um, against proper writing. And when there's social media and cook, you know, SMS, text messaging. But how important do you think writing is for programmers, designers? artists yeah uh, um you know writing is is um an important form of communication for sure um i think so i think it is important as you, you know if you're um if you're screening job applicants someone who is more eloquent and more articulate in their writing um is likely to be noticed sooner um but to put together a good uh, cover letter or something like that, you don't you don't have to be a writer. You just have to be attentive enough uh, to you, you know to put to put it together well. So I think um, you don't have to be like a writer by by profession by any means. But but uh, for sure, developing written communication skills as well as uh, like oral verbal communication skills is really important. I think in basically any um, in any position uh, as much as possible. But the good news is you'll have plenty of time to practice those skills, probably no matter what. Um, if you're if you're involved in any kind of project, you're going to be, you're probably going to be using written communication more than um, oral communication uh, day to day. But, uh, you know, it, like, that, that's one of those things. It just depends on the team culture. I think a lot of, you know, when you're sending Slack messages, people aren't necessarily being super mindful of their, of their like grammar or something like that, but it's still, but even knowing when it's okay to be more informal with people in text communication, I think is important. Um, just sort of like reading the room, finding the right tone um, with, with your, with your colleagues or with whomever you're interacting with. But uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's, that's like writing skill per se. That's just kind of, it's, it's the intersection of communication and, and writing. So some, some basic uh, writing skills I do think are very important. Um, do, do you, do you fix the errors of your team when they have grammatical errors or spelling uh, errors? <laughs> in what, um, in what, so, so when we're like working on, so if there is like, uh, I'll give you an example, you know, we're working on um, like a, like a presentation for the team, just covering some of our, some of our plans and stuff like that. I do uh, for sure do like an editing pass on those things. I do work on, on all of that to, to make sure that those are um, kind of as, as, as clean as can be. And that, yeah, my background as an editor uh, comes into play for that, for sure. I do like all, um, so I'm not just writing for our game, you, you know, I write our like patch notes and stuff like that. I write all, all sorts of stuff that has nothing to do uh, with the content in our games because uh, for it's, it's always for any kind of formal communication, it's always better when it's, uh, when it's kind of clean and easy to understand. Fantastic. Rick, it was a pleasure talking to you. Do you Thank have you, any sir. final comments? Um, I, I, um, I, I appreciate you having me um, on this program and, and reflecting on this. Um, I, I'm very fortunate to be working with uh, some really good leaders at Supergiant. Um, my colleagues, Amir and Jen and Gavin, um, they, um, and Andrew, they have managerial responsibilities in addition to the work that they do um and it's through uh it's through their own leadership by example i think that we've come as far uh as we have so 
I, I'm glad to work at a place that that doesn't think of this as an afterthought because it's not again you know leadership you know again it's not as fun as it's not as fun in quotation marks as designing a video game and thinking about you know cool abilities and stories but it's but it's we can't we can't do any of the rest of it uh, without it so um I yeah I'm I'm grateful uh, to my colleagues and the work they do. I think we all uh, lift each other up uh, through through this. So yeah, for thank sure, you. for sure. Uh, Greg Kazavin, thank you very much. I wish My you pleasure. and the great team at Supergiant the best with the next project that you guys thank you. hopefully start soon. Thank you. Likewise, all, all the best to your team. Thanks. Thank you very much, Greg. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care.